At the present time, the controversy over the use of mercury silver amalgam dental fillings is rapidly accelerating throughout the world. Indeed, several countries are already considering political action to limit or even ban further use of this controversial dental filling material. There must be a reason for this widening difference of opinion. The material that is commonly called silver amalgam or just silver fillings is actually 50% mercury. Scientific research has now clearly demonstrated that patients are exposed 24 hours each day to the mercury from these fillings, that it takes at least 60 days for the body to eliminate one half of each individual dose, that this mercury can penetrate the blood-brain barrier and the placental membrane and accumulates in the body with time, and that mercury is severe metabolic poison with no known safe exposure limit. Although this material has been used in dentistry for more than 150 years, it is important to know that dental scientists have never conducted broad studies to investigate the potential harmful effects of the mercury exposure from these fillings. Mercury is such a dangerous poison that it is important that each individual be informed of the actual scientific knowledge of this controversy so that they may make informed decisions that are in the best interest of their own health. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Chicago. I'm uh, a little rusty this morning. We didn't get in until 2 in the morning due to some plane difficulties, so I have a little trouble focusing for the first couple of minutes. Please uh, forgive me. Uh, basically, what I hope to do uh, in a very short span of time is review for you some of what I feel is the significant literature, including some of our own research, on mercury being released from dental amalgam and whether this uh, has a potential implication to human physiology. And uh, the basic question, and I think we must state scientifically that it's still a question, uh, is dental amalgam toxic factor fiction? And the reason why I say it's still a question is that although numerous dentists and physicians are seeing some changes in patient populations with amalgam re replacement in certain circumstances, there is a, a lack of good scientific data double-blind clinical type studies which scientists need to verify some of the effects that we're seeing. So as far as I'm concerned, I feel that there's reasonable doubt about amalgam safety, so I'm giving you my conclusion right up front. But I don't think we know yet all the nuances and the innuendos as to uh, what's causing what. That'll take time, that'll take scientific research, and that'll take money, all of which in North America don't, don't seem to be forthcoming. But back in 1970-71, the prestigious guide to dental materials and devices uh, said that mercury does give off small amounts of vapor under normal atmospheric conditions, but this vaporization stops as soon as mercury becomes coated with saliva. And this particular statement was drawn from the famous Freikholm study of 1957, a Swedish PhD thesis, which concluded uh, by various studies in animals and humans that amalgam did not gas off any mercury vapor. Uh, when one reviews that particular document, one finds that there is not any significant data within the thesis itself to support that particular proposition. And basically, this conclusion uh, from scientific perspective is an extrapolation of a very weak situation. So weak indeed that uh, on a personal communication with Dr. Freiberg from the Karolinski Institute, who was, I believe, Dr. Freikholm's uh, mentor for his thesis, uh, there is some consideration by Dr. Freiberg that perhaps some of the conclusions of the Freikholm paper were not as accurate as the dental profession worldwide has been led to believe. So science does change. Science is self-correcting. And this is what we're here to talk about, good science. You can't judge yesterday's dentistry by today's standards. And the absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Just because you have no data does not mean that a problem does not exist. Am I being heard all right, by the way? Yes. yes? Okay. 
Well, very briefly then, amalgam has been around for a long time, obviously not as long as mankind, but in 1812, it was developed by a British chemist, and it was 50%, 50 to 60 percent mercury. By, 19, by 1833, uh, its usage spread to North America. Uh, Everyone knows about the Krokor brothers who uh, practiced uh, dentistry uh, in the New York area, and there was the first amalgam war in North America, whether amalgam was safe or not. Now, the Krokor brothers lost, but as we can see, as time went on, problems did develop. By 1844, the American Society of Dental Surgeons outlawed the use of dental amalgam and mandated that all members of this particular body sign an oath that they would not use mercury in dentistry. So, in the 1800s, amalgam was banned by the licensing body for dentists at that time. However, amalgam uh, usage increased dramatically because it was inexpensive, easy to use, and the dentists uh, had an economic advantage over those who did not use amalgam. And by 1840 to 1860, uh, there was a major problem, and amalgam was sort of winning, uh, winning the war, even though the Krokors lost the battle. And at that time, finally, the American Society of Dental Surgeons had to disband because of lack of membership, and in its place rose the American Dental Association, founded by those individuals who were advocates of the use of dental amalgam. And today, the De uh, American Dental Association is the major voice uh, for dentistry, not only in the United States, but uh, some might say throughout the world. So I, I think that's interesting to see how the profession in the beginning felt that amalgam was not particularly a useful material because the toxic effects of mercury have been known all the way back to Hippocrates. This is not anything particularly new. Uh, and today we're at the opposite end of the subectum. Now the present status of amalgam fillings, just for a sort of a review, is that it's made up of silver about 69 percent. Uh, tin, 26 percent, copper, about 3 percent, and uh, zinc, 0.8 uh, percent. Now, that's the alloy. That's the powder. And that's mixed 50-50, or one-to-one, -one, with pure elemental mercury. As all the dentists here know, that's the same kind of mercury that's found in thermometers. And the lifespan of an average filling is approximately seven to nine years. Now, interestingly enough, each filling of, say, a large MOD, three-surface filling, would have about 1,000 milligrams of mercury one gram of mercury. So if you had 12 fillings in your mouth, you'd have 12 grams of mercury. Now that's a lot of mercury. And as we will see, uh, luckily or unluckily as the case may be, the mercury comes out slowly and not in large quantities all at once or else we'd have much greater problems. Of course, if it would have come out in more dramatic fashion, it wouldn't be around today as a, as a material. And the last time we looked in the literature, about 75 to 80 percent of all tooth restorations employed amalgam, although I think the statistics probably have changed dramatically. And so with the composites now and porcelain inlays and whatever else we have, uh, amalgam is starting to lose its, its usefulness. But in 1986, 140, 144,000 pounds of mercury were used in dentistry alone. 144,000 pounds of mercury. That's a phenomenal amount of mercury. And as we will see uh, through the discussions in the next couple of days, it does not necessarily take a lot of mercury exposure to cause uh, aberrant physiological problems. Well, what is the experiment, experimental evidence that amalgam is indeed gassing some of this uh, mercury vapor? And where is it going? And what can it possibly be doing? Well, mercury release from dental amalgam uh, occurs because of a corrosion phenomenon. It's an electrical chemical corrosion uh, with doing sulfide tarnishing. And when you have amalgam and gold mixed in a mouth, it increases the rate of corrosion by approximately tenfold. So if you look at Skinner and Phillips textbooks, they tell you not to put an amalgam next to a gold crown. But how many of us do this routinely on a daily basis? Almost all of us. And this increases the electrical potentials in the mouth and the corrosion. Uh, and amalgam has been known for a long time scientifically to corrode faster than any other dental material, material used in the mouth. Now you will notice through all my slides that at the bottom, I will give you the citation in the scientific literature if you wanted more information. This is a scientific meeting and we are, we are approaching this problem not in an anecdotal way. We are approaching this problem in a scientific fashion. And uh, what we hope to show is that the wealth of scientific information uh, leads to a reasonable doubt with regard to amalgam safety. So you can look on the slides and, and see the names of the people who did the research. 
And these are all, by the way, published research articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals. These are not articles that appear in lay magazines or unreviewed uh, journals. Anyways, some in vitro studies that were done showed that mercury released into human and artificial saliva. Uh, Namali, uh, if my memory serves me correct, actually worked or does work for the American Dental Association in their laboratory right here in Chicago. Uh, and Radix, a, a German researcher, showed that there was uh, a corrosion surface in the amalgams of extracted teeth and a loss of mercury in the superficial layers of these extracted teeth uh, in the amalgams. And Brun and, and Eve uh, had a met metabolic mechanical model where they had a simulated chewer and they showed that mercury would be released from the fillings during chewing in an automated machine. So these in vitro or out of the mouth studies uh, indicate that mercury is lost from old fillings. In situ studies and in the mouse studies, the first one of, of, of real note in the last little, uh, little while was uh, Dr. Gay in 1979, uh, published in uh, Lancet, uh, and he used breath samples and he showed that uh, mercury in the, uh, in the breath was four times greater after chewing than before chewing. Dr. Savare, who worked with Dr. Gay, then showed that rapidly exhaled air had 15 times greater amount of mercury in it, so that's air that's blown out of the lungs into a bag. And Abraham, uh, his student, showed that flushed mouth air, uh, that the levels of mercury rose after three minutes of chewing. And finally, Patterson uh, from uh, New Zealand showed that even toothbrushing will cause a significant rise in mercury vapor. So it seems that anything that will stimulate the surface, the occlusal surface of the restoration, will cause mercury to be released. In fact, we have shown that you can even scratch the tooth or the filling with an explorer, and if you put the probe in there, you will get some trace amounts of mercury coming off. So free mercury must be there and must be available for release. Well, Dr. Savari's paper in 1981 probably uh, was the cornerstone of the beginnings of the modern revolution of the Third uh, Amalgam War, as, as some have seemed to called it, and that's the debate that the profession is under today. And Dr. Safari used 40 subjects with varying numbers of dental amalgams. Eight of those subjects had no dental amalgams, and they were the controls. And he measured exhaled air. In other words, he had the patients come in. Uh, they would not eat or drink for about 12 hours. Uh, he would take an, uh, a sample by having them blow into a bag and measure the amount of mercury he found in a sample of air from that specific polyethylene bag. Uh, he then had them chew gum for 10 minutes, and after the 10 minutes, he had them again blow into the bag, and he took a sample. All right? And what he found is that there was a 15.6-fold increase in mercury after chewing in those people that had the fillings, whereas the controls showed no change. So definitely then, the mercury was coming most likely from the fillings, since we know that the fillings have a source of mercury in them. And his conclusion back in 1981, uh, published in the Journal of Dental Research, was that the assimilation of mercury from in situ amalgam restorations via the respiratory route is probable. So the first warning flag went up in 1981. The first warning flag in the modern era went up in 1981. Uh, of course, as a little flashback, Back in the 1920s, uh, there were some Germans uh, who, uh, Strunk, uh, Stock uh, was the fellow's name, who advocated that amalgams were a toxic material. Dr. Stock was a prominent uh, chemist in Germany, and he was the uh, uh, president of the German Chemical Society, so he was no lightweight. So the issue of the second amalgam war occurred in the 1920s, 1930s, and the third amalgam war, which we are in today, uh, started really in about 1975. However, there's an important thing to understand. Blowing into a bag is a lot different than inhaling. It's like oats that have already gone through the horse. You know, if you want fresh oats, you know, you buy them at the store, but if you want something that's been used, you know, you can collect it at the other end. Well, Dr. Savare was collecting mercury vapor th that was coming out, and he was finding changes. And we wondered, in our laboratory, what were the possibilities that a, a larger and more significant amount of mercury was going in? with the inhalation. And indeed, uh, Nielsen Kutz had shown that approximately 80 to 100 percent of, of elemental mercury vapor, mercury in its vapor form, is absorbed through the lungs upon an inhalation, which means that if Dr. Savari was measuring an amount of mercury that was significant to him coming out of the lungs, there must have been about 80 percent more going in. Everyone follow that. So we wanted to try and see if this was indeed the case or if or what we were seeing was just a transient brief phenomenon. 
But we have done three major papers, pub all published in the Journal of Dental Research, myself and Dr. Fritz Lorscheider, a world-class physiologist at the medical school. And uh, these papers address the issue of how much and what is the significance. Our first paper, uh, published in the Journal of Dental Research in 1985, was to look at intraoral air mercury release from dental amalgams, whereas Dr. Savare looked at exhaled air. And I think as we go through this, and I won't bore you with some of the uh, numbers, but I think you'll find it most uh, fascinating. And what we used was 35 subjects with varying numbers of dental amalgams, and 11 subjects that had no amalgam restorations at all as our controls. And when I say no, no amalgam restorations at all, they never had amalgam restorations. And believe me, it's very hard to find 11 people in the average practice that doesn't have an amalgam. We used a Jerome instrument, which is a specific gold-foiled mercury vapor analyzer machine. It's a state-of-the-art machine for measuring mercury vapor. And we took a random sample of intraoral air by moving the probe around. The sample size is approximately 250 mils, and it takes approximately 20 seconds to take the sample. 20 seconds. Remember that number because it's important. We'll discuss it later. And what we found, the white bars represent our data, and the unfilled bars represent Dr. Savare's data. And what you can see is that there was a, a six-fold increase in the experimentals over the controls. And a 54-fold increase in mercury post-chewing experimentals over the controls. So you can see the two largest bars here uh, indicate the after-chewing. Those are the people with the fillings. And the two smaller bars, but of a larger size, are over uh, on the left-hand side. Those represent uh, the people with, those four bars represent the people with amalgams. The little bars over on the right represent those individuals who had no amalgams. So it's graphically shown that there's a very significant amount. And indeed, as you can see, our large solid bar is, a, is a just about two times as high as Dr. Savare's unfilled middle bar. So indeed, there was a lot more mercury going in than coming out. And I think that's an important point to know. And so now we're looking at something of a greater phenomenon than even Dr. Savare had anticipated with his exhaled air. And we concluded that, that intraoral air mercury is a reliable physiological indicator of mercury release from dental amalgam that may reflect a major source of chronic mercury exposure. So back in 1985, uh, we already concluded that you can use intraoral air to measure at least the potential exposure as a risk factor to people. And if we look at this particular graph, just for some examples, we can see that these are permissible adult merc uh, worker exposure levels. And what that means is that these are, are exposure levels that would be allowed in the workplace. The workplace, where people are controlled, where they know they're being exposed to mercury, where they're under medical supervision to know that they're being exposed to mercury. And as you can see, it varies all the way in Switzerland uh, to 10 micrograms in the ambient air, all the way up to 100 micrograms in the air by OSHA here in the United States. So if they came into this room with that same meter that I used in the mouth and they measured the air in this room, they would have, across various countries, different standards. So the question becomes, where are you safe? Are you safe in the United States at 100 micrograms? Or are you safe in Sweden? and Switzerland, rather, at 10 micrograms. In other words, there's a great deal of uneasiness within the uh, community of researchers as to what is a safe level for mercury. And in fact, there is no safe level for mercury. It's dose-response relationship. The higher the dosage, the greater the symptomatology will be on a population basis. The lower the dosage, the less the symptomatology will be, or the problems will be, all the way down to subclinical. But mercury is mercury. Mercury is a toxin. Mercury has physiological effects. In small amounts for some individuals, it may only be at the cellular level. In larger amounts, it may manifest itself as disease. And on top of that is the entire thing of individual susceptibility. Some individuals could walk in this room if it was filled with mercury and not really have any major problems. Other individuals who are super sensitive, either um, toxicologically, or immunologically could be exposed to very low levels of mercury and have problems. And the third group are people who are actually allergic to mercury, and we will go into that too. So there are a lot of problems here. Anyways, we showed that intraoral air had very high levels of mercury vapor in it, 
So our next experiment published in the same volume of the journal was to try and determine, well, what is the daily dose? Because you see, if you know what someone is exposed to daily, then you have some idea of what might be accumulating in the tissues. So a one-time reading, which was the first study, does not tell you much except that significant, significant amounts of mercury are being released. What you have to know is that, is this effect occurring over time during the entire day? And if so, what is the possibility that the person is being exposed to a large daily dose? So basically that were the objectives which I've just uh, said to you. And we used similar sampling technique as our first paper. And what we did is exactly the same thing. People would come in. They would not eat, chew, or drink for at least uh, one or two hours before the experiment. We would take an intraoral mercury vapor reading. We would then give them gum to chew. And every five minutes thereafter, we would take a reading in their mouth of intraoral air and give them a fresh piece of gum to chew. At the end of a half hour, we stopped taking readings in the mouth. We stop, had them stop chewing gums. And then every five minutes thereafter, again, we continued to take the readings. So we took readings for a half hour of chewing and readings for a half hour thereafter during non-chewing. And here's what we got. We got a curve that showed a rapid exponential rise, reaching its peak at about the 10-minute interval and plateauing thereafter, which means if you're chewing and having a meal, it takes about 10 minutes of chewing to get the mercury vapor level to maximally be coming off those fillings. After the 10 minutes, if you continue chewing, it plateaus. Now, at time 30, that's when we had them stop chewing gum, and every five minutes thereafter, taking vapor readings, the mercury levels showed a curvilinear slow drop. It takes 90 minutes after you stop eating a meal for the mercury vaporization from your fillings to go back down to the pre-chewing level. Now, I think that's significant. So not only are you exposed to mercury while you eat, you are exposed to mercury for 90 minutes after you eat. And in North America, we have breakfast, and 90 minutes later, we have what? Coffee time. All right? It's usually something to chew on, something to eat. And then 90 minutes later, it's lunchtime. So you can see the average American, if all he did was eat his normal routine, would be going up and down on a roller coaster of mercury exposure from the dental fillings. And we have not addressed yet other factors. What about the chronic gum chewer, the teenager? What about the nocturnal bruxer? Those people obviously would have much greater exposures not because of the number of fillings they have, but because of their behavior, because of their be chewing behavior. So yes, dental amalgam is a safe material if you don't chew on it. Now, we took that group of people, that was the group of 35 people, and we broke it down into subcategories. The top curve are those people with 12 or more dental amalgams. The second curve are those people with four or less dental amalgams, and the bottom dotted line represents the controls. And you can see there's a considerable difference in exposure. So the greater the number of amalgams you have, the greater the exposure. Now think with me for a second. What does the area under that curve represent? It represents the cumulative dose that a person would have from eating that half-hour meal. Of course, that dose would have to be corrected, or these, this graph would have to be corrected by certain physiological breathing uh, things and would bring down the number. But, but basically, the area under that curve represents the dose. And this doesn't show well, so I don't worry about it. But basically, what we did is we made some assumptions. If individuals had three meals and three snacks and they had certain respiratory patterns, what would they be exposed to? And what we have shown, if you look at the very far side, and I apologize for this kind of uh, picture, it, it is rather small, it shows that people with 12 or more dental amalgams would have approximately 29 micrograms a day exposure to mercury, on average, based upon our assumptions. All right, the estimation of daily dose is based upon assumptions. Nothing more, it's merely a calculation. So the conclusions of that second paper were that subjects with 12 or more dental amalgams receive an average estimated dose of 30 micrograms. Number two, elemental mercury exposure from dental amalgam restorations approaches or exceeds some threshold limit values. As I showed you in a previous graph, the TLVs were set at 10 in some countries. So obviously, if you're, if you're at 30, you're going to be exceeding the threshold limit values. 
Uh, and finally, dental amalgam makes a major contribution to mercury exposure on a daily basis. We were the first to come up and state that, that dental amalgam makes a major contribution to mercury exposure on a daily basis to the average population. We are pleased that our colleagues in Sweden have seen fit through their research to confirm our findings. And we will go into that briefly, and we have some of our distinguished colleagues here to discuss some of these things with you. So amalgam, from a scientific perspective, in peer-reviewed scientific studies that have been published, uh, be they controversial or not, the, the thought among those of us who are actually doing the research in this field is that amalgam makes a major contribution of mercury. Not the opposite. Not that, as we were told, once the filling is mixed, no mercury vapor is ever released. I mean, all you had to do was look in our mouth and see a corroded amalgam, and you knew that wasn't true, yet we believe that it was. I don't understand it, and that just seems to be the way things have been. So let us compare a few things just for interest's sakes, and I'll try and do it quickly. Uh, in the first column there, we have uh, daily mercury exposure. On the second column, we have the, uh, the time-weighted... Uh, what is that? Yeah, the, the time-weighted effect, the, the total weekly intake, rather. Uh, that's what it is, total weekly intake. And then we have an estimated body burden using two methods. Uh, Drs. Brunin and, and Eve, in their studies, uh, using that chewing model I told you about, they estimated that 180 micrograms of mercury were released on a daily basis. Radix, looking at old fillings, estimated at 150 micrograms. Now, we're looking down the first column. Milligrams of mercury were, was a daily exposure. Uh, we, we estimated about 30, and Patterson et al. estimated about 27. So as you can see, there's literature that's been published that are way higher than what we're talking about, the first two. All right. Now, if you look at the, at the weekly intake, uh, Brune and Eve estimate about 1,260 micrograms are being absorbed at a weekly basis, and you can just follow down and see the numbers. And same thing with the body burdens. And basically, the only reason for showing this is to show that our estimations, when it comes to reviewing the scientific literature, are actually on the conservative side. It's important to know that. So we're not talking about being an extremist here. There are others who have published who have come to much more dramatic levels. All right, so what have we established so far? We've established that intraoral air has a lot of mercury in it after you chew, and we've established that on a daily basis there's a significant mercury exposure. So what? The next thing that came out from certain quarters was that, well, yes, we have to say now that mercury does come out of these fillings. You know, you've shown us that it does, but it's transient, it's so small, it's meaningless, it doesn't affect human physiology, it's no more than eating a can of tuna fish. You know, and you hear this. We don't see people dying in the street, so it can't be a problem. Okay, well, I gotta, I'm here to tell you that the issue is not a matter of life and death, it's a matter of quality of life. People aren't going to die from their fillings necessarily. At least I haven't seen any, but maybe there have been. I don't know. But they are going to have changes in their quality of life, perhaps, if they are susceptible. So we tried then to do a, a completely, what I call, philosophical experiment, an experiment that involved no research, an experiment that just involved mathematics and just involved seeing what this would be. And what that was is to take this daily dose and use a model, a mathematical model for mercury, to see how this mercury would accumulate hypothetically in this model. And the model was supposed to represent human physiology. In other words, it was a published model. And so we tried to predict the compartmentalization of the mercury uh, in order to determine the body burden. In other words, exposed to X for so many years, what would the potential be in the brain, in the liver, and the kidney? All right? And we wanted to develop a computer simulation to protect these, to project these <laughs> tissue burdens. So we used the data from that second paper, and we generated through a simple IBM tabletop computer that most of you probably have either at home or in your office. And we utilized this equation here, which is the equation of Bernard and Purdue, which is a published model, one of them, for mercury accumulation. There are a lot of models. This is just one of them. We chose this one. It, it appealed to us at the time. And what we found when we graphed this stuff, now this is a logarithmic graph. All right, so it's log log. So you can see, although the spaces between those tens are equal, the first ten is ten, but the second ten is what? A hundred and the third ten is a thousand. So although the distances are the same, really if you spread this graph out, it would be as high as this building. Okay, so you can understand that as you move away from zero, you're really getting into some high numbers, just like pH. 
All right? And what you see is that this is a four compartmental model. R1, R2, R3, and R4. And the interesting fact here is that R1 reaches equilibrium after about five days. So after about five days of exposure to 30 micrograms, which was our estimated daily dose, 30 micrograms, 30 micrograms every day, all right, it would take about five days before you plateaued. For R2, it would take about 100 days. For R3, about 300 days. And for R4, the long-term compartment in this model, it would take 10,000 days and it still would never plateau. That's the half-life. And so in the lifetime of a human being, it would never plateau. In fact, it would take 100,000 days for it to finally plateau. So what they're telling us is that there are some tissues in the body that hold on to mercury and just don't let it go. And it's like a sink with a plug in it. And you've gone on vacation. Not a problem if you come back on time. A costly problem if you don't. So one has to understand when one considers the toxicology of mercury is that part of it is a slow, insidious accumulation of a heavy metal which has a latency period until enough mercury is accumulated in susceptible tissue to cause problems. Consequently, you get your amalgams, and this is hypothetical, when you're a child and a teenager, and it may be in your 30s and 40s and 50s before you might, quotation marks, experience some medical effects of the mercury. That's one form of the problem. All right? So we're the first to admit that fillings vaporize a small amount of mercury. Small. But you have this time, which is also on the opposite side of the scale. And when you multiply the two together, it equals problem at the other end. All right? Well, the half-life of brain was the only tissue that we could find uh, in the scientific literature that would have a 10,000-day half-life. So we figured that R4 in that computer model must be neurological tissue. And we know that 1 to 3% of the elemental mercury vapor reaches the brain in about four hours, and that's very well established scientifically. So we postulated that perhaps if one expected all the mercury in that compartment to be brain, that you'd have about 4.8 micrograms of mercury per gram. But on the other hand, if that long-term component was your entire body, then you end up, and it's not on this particular slide, at about 68 nanograms of mercury per gram. Now, this former is obviously not in line with what's been found now experimentally in human autopsy work. But the latter, the 68, definitely falls into the ranges that have been published in various studies, which you will probably hear about today. And that just shows what our computer printout looks like for that model. And so here's what we predicted. We predicted that about 40 nanograms of mercury per gram in brain would be found if the brain were just part of the whole body and R4 was not just the brain. And actually, well, what Freiberg et al., and some of these numbers are not quite correct, we have better slides coming up, but was actually measured by Freiberg and Nylander, and Nylander and Freiberg, and Eggleston and Nylander, and Nylander's name keeps coming up and you'll meet him soon, uh, that uh, there's a lot of mercury coming out in this brain tissue, and our 48 or 45 there is not far off from the kinds of ranges that were found in some subjects. So, we have now, we believe, and there are some corrections to be made, we now can go one more step with our conclusion. You can go into the mouth and assess the mercury vapor readings. You can make some hypothetical assumptions about how much people chew and how much they breathe. And you can come out with a number that may not be absolutely accurate, but is certainly predictive of what has been found in autopsy material. And these autopsy brain levels correlate with the number of fillings. So these men who have been doing research on autopsy human studies have found that the mercury levels in the brain actually correlate with the number of fillings people have. The more fillings you have, the more mercury you have. Interesting. We believe that you now have a test to determine a risk factor. We believe that using the intraoral mercury vapor analyzer, if for no other reason than to try and predict the person's exposure and potential risk, is a valuable adjunct. So our overall conclusions then is that dental amalgam constitutes a, a significant source of mercury exposure, that individuals with high number of amalgams run the risk of actual toxicity. Because we've had people in our clinic who have had intraoral vapor readings that are two to three-fold higher than any of the people that we happen to have in our sample. So there are people walking out there with horrendous amounts of vapor in their mouth. And that even at low levels of exposure, neurological tissue may be at risk because of the long-term cumulative effect. Number four, 
that blood levels of less than 0.1 micrograms per 100 mil can still impair the blood-brain barrier. So even low, low, low levels of exposure will affect the blood-brain barrier. And of course, when you affect that, you allow other potential toxins floating in the blood and byproducts of metabolism to cross into a place that they shouldn't be. And number five, that under low-dose continuous exposure, mercury probably collects in neurological tissue due to its 10,000-day half-life. Now, there's some question, is it really 10,000 days? And we had a good discussion sometime back in Calgary. And there are various models. Maybe it's only one year or two years. Maybe it's not 10,000. But does it matter? There is a long-term compartment. Does it matter if our models actually are absolutely predictive? Of course not, because the research, the data, the tissues taken from human subjects, their brain tissues, show that there's mercury there coming from the fillings. And not only that, there are now two preliminary studies using animals to show that when you place the amalgams in the animals, one study done in uh, guinea pigs by Dr. Frieden, and one study uh, done in monkeys, and I'm sorry, I forget the name of these, the individual, but they were small uh, preliminary studies showing that the mercury gets to the brain tissue. There's no doubt now either retrospectively looking at autopsy material or prospectively using an animal model that mercury is getting there. So, back in about 1987, the Swedish National Board of Occupational Safety and Health came out with the decision that dental amalgams is the largest non-occupational source of mercury exposure. <coughs> And we like to feel that perhaps our research had something to play in that, because that, of course, was one of our conclusions, wasn't it, in our previous paper. So we have there uh, a member of their Occupational Safety and Health Board, uh, Dr. Scar, who did some research. So it's really not the opinion of the National Health Board of Sweden. It's probably the opinion of Dr. Scar. I hope that's the way you, you pronounce it, uh, that, that amalgam is a significant thing. Well. I gotta tell you, in science there's always controversy, and that's the way it should be. Because to get to truth, you have to have debate. And to have debate, you have to have opposing opinions. Even amongst those of us who feel amalgam may not be as safe as it could be, or should be, uh, there is debate as to how significant the problems are. But Dr. Mackert, uh, in the Journal of Dental Research recently, in his 1987, published a paper that was a theoretical paper where he took our data and applied his assumptions and came out with his conclusion. And he concluded, uh, it says right here, that the exposure from dental amalgam uh, restorations was actually 16-fold lower than our previous estimates. So what he's saying is that our 30 micrograms a day exposure for a person with 12 fillings is wrong, really, if we had done it correctly and done our calculations properly, we would have come out with a 16-fold lower uh, estimate. Uh, he presented no data to support that. It was merely, again, a model with his new assumptions. And I think what we should do is look at that. Because you see, today, uh, organized dentistry and the people who are advocating amalgam safety are using this paper, which is merely theoretical, as the jump-off point that we were wrong for some reason. Now, we can't be wrong because we have, uh, gratefully, all this autopsy research to back up what we had anticipated. But Meckert's first assumption was that mercury vapor is quantitatively collected in the mouth. Now, what that means is that when we go in there, we're getting all the mercury, quantitatively, not qualitatively, not sampling. What he's saying is that we go in there, we're getting it all because it's such a small space, even when it's open. Well, that's not true, because you see, in order to have quantitative collection, you have to have a closed system where nothing can get in and nothing can, can leave except by you taking it out and you putting it in. Well, the open oral cavity has mercury which can diffuse across the mucous membranes. So some mercury is lost. Mercury can diffuse and uh, become incorporated into saliva and be swallowed. So some mercury is lost. Uh, mercury vaporization is unidirectional out of the fillings. Once it leaves, it can't go back in because the surface of the filling has changed when the mercury leaves and it re-corrodes and the mercury can't go back in. All right? And not only that, as you take mercury out of the mouth, room air is going in to replace the air that you're removing in the open mouth. So, the open mouth is not a system under which you can quantitatively collect the mercury vapor. So we're not. And there's a dilution factor. And there's mercury being lost. It's an open system. Meckert's assumption number two, that the amount of mercury collected per unit time is flush rate dependent. 
And what he's saying there is that if you speed your machine up and run it faster, you're going to get more mercury collected in the machine than if you run it slower. But you think about it. How is that possible? Uh, mercury vaporization rate in an open system is solely dependent upon temperature and the physical characteristics of a subject. That's basic physics. You heat something up to a certain temperature, it starts to vaporize at a rate that's predetermined by physics. Flushing the rate across it and sucking out air faster, as long as the heat's being maintained, does not change the rate of vaporization. If the rate of vaporization does not change, how are you going to collect more mercury vapor? Because your rate limiting step is the vaporization rate, not the rate of your collection. You can collect it as fast as you want. It it's, it's depends on how fast it's coming off the fillings or off the mercury that's crucial. All right? So what does happen? Well, if you take a sample for 20 seconds at a slow rate, you're going to have a small amount of volume, and you're going to have a concentration, and you're going to have an amount, right? The concentration will be, this, will be a certain number, and the amount of mercury that's collected in there will be a different number. All right? Now, if you take the same 20 seconds, but you now increase the rate at which you're collecting the mercury, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that only the concentration will, will change. The amount of mercury coming off in 20 seconds is the amount of mercury coming off in 20 seconds. It doesn't matter if you take it quickly or take it slowly uh, in terms of the machine motor running. 20 seconds is 20 seconds. The concentration will change. Because if you have a fast rate of collection, you're going to have a larger sample, and that amount will be diluted in a larger sample. If you have a slower collection rate, you'll have a smaller size sample because you're collecting less air, but the amount that comes off in 20 seconds will still be the same. Does everyone follow? So what you have here is a situation where in both samples, the amount's the same, x. But the, the, the difference is, is the concentration because of the size of the volume. So that's not true, obviously. His third assumption is that the collection rate of the mercury vapor analyzers equals the vaporization rate from the amalgam. He just made a blatant assumption that what's collected in the machine is equal to what comes off the fillings. And we say that uh, that might be true for a closed system in which all the air is removed without creating a vacuum, but it's not possible in an open oral cavity due to dilution and mercury loss. So, a third of his assumptions in this paper is totally, absolutely not scientifically substantiated. And fourth, that only mercury vapor during, and this is the big one, that only mercury vaporized during the time of oral inhalation, now an oral inhalation takes 2.5 seconds, is available for respiratory absorption. So he's saying here <coughs> that I'm taking a 20 second sample, but your lungs only get a 2.5 second sample. 2.5 into 20 is 16. That's where the 16-fold difference comes in, okay? So what he's saying is that you can't compare the two. The machine, he says, breathes over a 20-second period, whereas the human lung breathes over a 2.5-second period. But you see, mercury vaporizes continuously. Whether your mouth is open, whether your mouth is closed, whether you breathe through your nose, whether you breathe through your mouth, or whether you inhale or whether you exhale, mercury vapor is constantly coming off. So, the less frequently you inhaled orally, the less frequently you inhaled orally, the greater the exposure to mercury. Just the opposite. One would have thought that the more you breathe in orally, the greater the exposure. Just the opposite. Let me show you why. See, every inhalation has an exhalation. So if you are a nose breather, and you're breathing through your nose, and your mouth is closed, what's happening in your mouth? The mercury vapor is collecting, right? Then all of a sudden, you take a, a breath through your mouth. Everything that was collected while you were nose breathing goes into your lungs. But if you happen to uh, breathe uh, one breath nasally and one breath orally, which is not the custom by most people, all right? But it, unless you're a runner, you know, and then, then you do a lot of oral breathing because you get more oxygen that way, all right? Uh, but then what happens, of course, is that when you exhale, you blow off anything that's collecting in the mouth. So you see, those people who are nose breathers, are actually at greater risk than those people who are mouth breathers. In fact, that was the opposite to what we had anticipated. So the 16-fold difference that he talks about is because he won't recognize the fact that some of the mercury that's going to the lung happens to be mercury that's sitting in the mouth collecting while the person is nasal breathing. Everyone follow that? That's a subtle point, but I think it's crucial. And that's the basis of his problem. If he corrects for the fact 
that oral nasal breathing has to be adjusted for properly, we come out with exactly the same numbers. And interestingly enough, a paper that we have in progress right now addresses Makerit's uh, problems on a theoretical basis, corrects his faulty errors, we also have to correct something that we did that wasn't quite, quite totally correct. And when you make the corrections on both sides, we find out, lo and behold, that using his model to find out how much mercury is being uh, exposed on a daily basis, you get to the same amount that we do. It's all a matter of assumptions. And if you make faulty assumptions and they get published, then you've got a problem. But science is self-correcting. And hopefully, this will get corrected. Well, we have to revise our, uh, our understanding, too, uh, because this equation here is the type of equation that we use to determine uh, mercury exposure in, in populations. But what we fail to realize is that if a person is oral nasal breathing, all right, breathing sometimes through his mouth, that not only do you have to, uh, not only do you have to correct for the oral nasal breathing ratio, uh, you have to correct both time and volume. So in the first equation up there, you can see the 0.5 at the end of the equation, all right, just before the equal sign, all right. In that equation, oral nasal breathing only corrected once. It corrected for volume. In the second equation, when you correct it twice, both for time and volume, our numbers are now half. So we are here today to tell you that our estimates, be they only estimates, uh, once they're corrected for this error on our part, this 0.5, come out to be half of what was previously pu published. Now, don't let that frighten you. Half is still an awful lot, and it doesn't change any of the conclusions. But when we make this correction by a factor of half, then we find that our numbers and Mackert's numbers, if he would correct his equation, would come out exactly equal. And indeed, uh, if we look at, at brain tissue levels, we look at Freiburg et al. 1986, uh, and showing a, a mean of 9.7 and a range of 3.6 to 3.33.8. Uh, Eggleston and Nylander et al., uh, looking at autopsy work here in the United States, uh, being examined in Sweden, uh, showed means of 8.51 and 7.42, with ranges from 3.0 to 121.4. And, and Nylander himself with Freiburg uh, in the Swedish Dental Journal uh, showed means of 10.9 and 11.2. Uh, with ranges of 2.4 uh, all the way up to 3.6 to 33.8. So the average average or the average mean is about 9.5, this mean at the bottom, okay? One can't just look at means. One has to also look at these ranges. Look at the great variability of mercury exposure all the way from 1.7 all the way up to uh, uh, 121.4. Some people, perhaps, if their exposure is due to their amalgams, have extremely high collections of mercury vapor as compared to the mean. And that's what we anticipate, or would anticipate. Well, let's take a look and see what our predictions do. Uh, our original metabolic model would predict that the brain levels would be at 44 nanograms. But the mean of the means is, at the bottom, 9.5. Uh, our revised number, which is what I just showed you by correcting by 50% again, uh, is at 22. But Mackert would predict that the uh, amount of mercury collecting in the brain tissue would only be 2.75 nanograms. 2.75 nanograms when the average is coming out around 10 and where the range goes all the way up to 121. I question whether his 1.24 micrograms a day as, as a dose is possible. How can you have a daily dose 16-fold lower than what we're calculating and still have brain tissue levels that correlate with the fillings uh, at the levels that have been suggested in the literature? All right? And uh, if, you, uh, if you look at these things and try and look at, at body burden and, and see what you come out with, uh, you can see that uh, Mackert's estimated, da estimated daily dose is, uh, is 1.24, and the estimated brain level would be 0.6. The mean would be 0.6, but the studies show 10, not 0.6, 10. All right, Vivian Lorscheider, uh, our estimated daily dose, now that it's corrected, would be 9.5, and we come out with 4.8. Uh, so we're, we're lower now than the 10. We're not above the 10. All right, that's using a certain set of assumptions. Under another set of assumptions by Clarkson, using the same data, you would find that we are approximately 50% higher than what was actually being found in, uh, in neural tissue. 
So any way you look at it, you, you have a choice. Here's the conclusion. You can either believe Mackert and be 433% wrong, or you could believe us and be 56% too high. All right? Both ways, all we're doing is estimating. The real juice and, and meat of the matter is that someone's measured brain levels. All right? And you can pick whoever you want. You have to address the issue now. My God, this mercury's in the brain. Okay? That means that our research certainly has some usage. It has a certain usage in being predictable. We are much better at predicting these levels than Macrid is. And we base our predictions on data. He bases his predictions on assumptions. Of course, we had some assumptions too, but he didn't have any data at all. So, if you look at the permissible daily intake, uh, what, what's permissible in the daily intake, if you look at the World Health Organization, would be about 42 micrograms. And the EPA would be about 30 micrograms. And a person with, with 12 fillings is going to have half of that. He's going to have 15 micrograms now. So that last column is, is off now because of our correction. Okay? So, dental amalgam restoration. Yes? I have to ask this question. Why do you assume that all of the, the total mercury and toxic load is coming from vapor? What about what's absorbed into the tissue and through the tooth? Absolutely. The question. The question was, why do we assume it's all coming from vapor? And one of the reasons that we, we assume that it's all coming from vapor is that vapor is the kind that most readily gets into the body. Particulate particles of amalgam don't get absorbed. They might get broken down to some extent in the gastrointestinal tract, but the amounts have never been measured all right, as to what's going in. All right, we can talk about that a little later and, and go over it. So let's uh, go over a few things. You know, I had a schedule here. Is everybody okay? Have I got your attention? Good. All right. Are you excited? Are you interested? Are you stop chewing gum? <laughs> <coughs> All right. Dental amalgam mercury toxicity, toxicity factor fiction. Well, anecdotal information aside, that Joe Schmo with this disease and that disease is well and healthy again. Leaving all that stuff out, looking at the science of what we have here, that the experimental evidence suggests that dental amalgam mercury exposure could be a health consequence to some people. Now. People in medicine, ladies and gentlemen, make mistakes. They correct them. Science and medicine corrects them. Dentistry as a much smaller profession cannot be faulted, nor am I here to fault any organization or any researcher. But we are definitely undermanned. Think of it. Where in the human body are non-biological materials routinely placed on a daily basis without very little uh, concern as to the compatibility in there in the office. We're not working with populations as clinicians. We're working with individuals. And because the material is shown to be safe for a population, because the means don't uh, show a difference on a, on a t-test, uh, does not mean that one patient walking into your door may not have a problem with it. And it depends on what level of care you want to give. If you want to practice group dentistry, then you could say, well, the group of patients that I have, on, on average, are healthy of, because of the materials I use. But individually, we may be producing harmful effects in some people, allergic effects, toxic effects. And amalgam isn't the only one. There's formaldehydes, there's nickel, there's beryllium, there's chromium. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And we're undermanned scientifically. And some of these problems, to be frank, are beyond the scope of the various dental schools because they don't have the kind of research people to do the work. If you were a PhD in biology, where would you go? A dental school or a medical school? Well, obviously, if I was to choose it, I would go to a medical school. There's more variety of research. The field is infinite. If you go to a dental school, you're stuck with a few dental diseases. So we don't attract a lot of people. We can't afford to support a lot of people. We don't have the funding for a lot of people. Yet I maintain, and I believe this, and this is not scientific, and I hope it's the only non-scientific thing I say, is that there are some problems, I think, lurking out there that deserve our scientific attention. And dentistry is not the army. It's not ruled from the top down. It's ruled from the bottom up. The foot soldiers are the ones that determine dental practice. You and I determine what is reasonable and customary care. You and I determine what's the average level of care in our locale because we are the ones that are participating in it. And so we have to have influence upon the dental schools and upon our colleagues who are uh, political type 
dentists who are working in organizations to try and bring them along to having a more open mind. All right. There are some misconceptions. The first misconception is that elemental mercury is not very toxic. Well, the World Health Organization back in 1980 uh, recommended uh, in their article the uh, recommended health uh, basis limits and occupational exposure to heavy metals, a technical report, and here's their, their exact quotation, the most hazardous forms of mercury to human health are elemental mercury vapor and short chain alkyl materials. So mercury vapor is almost, and I think is, number one in terms of its ability to produce toxicity because it passes right through tissue. It just goes right to the tissue of your gums, right to the lung lining. Nothing stops it. All right? So don't ever let anyone tell you that, that mercury is not hazard elemental mercury. Now, elemental mercury in the liquid form, if you happen to swallow it, is much less harmful because less is absorbed. But vapor, that invisible, odorless thing that's produced in all dental offices when you grind out a filling, is very toxic. And if you don't care about the patient consequences, you might want to start caring about the personal consequences of your health and the health of your staff working in an environment with a material like mercury. The next misconception is that if these vapor levels were coming off the fillings, they would disintegrate in a short period of time. Since we don't see large numbers of fillings disintegrating, the vapor measurements can't be correct. Right? Well, let's take a look at that. Uh, if a complex amalgam has about 1,000 milligrams of mercury, that would mean just about a million micrograms. If 12 complex amalgams are present uh, in a mouth, then there are 12,000 milligrams or 12 million micrograms available. So your mouth with 12 amalgams has 12 million micrograms of mercury in it. If on average 30 micrograms are lost per day from the dental restoration in, in 10 years, that means in 10 years only 109,500 micrograms are lost. In other words, in 10 years, less than 1% of the mercury is lost from the fillings. That's what we're saying. Of course the fillings don't disintegrate. Of course dental amalgam is a wonderful material and lasts a long time in the mouth. Of course it's great because it's self-sealing and corrodes and rusts itself right into place. And of course it's not falling apart because we published that probably only 1% of the mercury is really coming out. But 1% of 12 million micrograms is a lot of mercury, especially if it's collecting in brain tissue, some of it. Well, Phillips and Schwartz, Phillips, Skinner and Phillips, Phillips and Schwartz, all the way back in 1949 in the Journal of Dental Research, looked at old fillings from extracted teeth and found that the residual mercury to be between 28 uh, to 61 percent, with a mean of 45 percent. He found, looking at old fillings, an average loss of 10 percent I'm talking less than 1%. He's looking at old fillings in 1949 and figuring 10% is lost. Phillips. Now, if we take his assumption, which probably is way too high, uh, then what happens is that a person would be exposed to, at the bottom of this, 328 micrograms a day over a 10-year period. Any way you slice it, the fillings don't have the same amount of mercury in them 10 years after as they did the day they were placed. We can see that visually by looking at those black corroded fillings. Another misconception is that exposure to mercury below the threshold limit value, which are the safety standards we talked about, is safe. But Dr. Sheldon Newman, now at the University of Colorado, said that a basic law of, uh, or basic concept of toxicology is that exposure to a toxin below certain levels is safe, since the body's protective mechanisms can clear the toxins without accumulation or expression of toxicity. And that's absolutely not true. It's well documented scientifically that exposures to some individuals below the TLVs or the threshold limit value for the workplaces will produce problems. Well, the threshold limit standards uh, themselves, a, a TLV is a time-weighted average concentration for a normal eight-hour day or 40-hour work week to which nearly, nearly all workers may be repeatedly exposed day after day without adverse effects. It didn't say all, it said nearly all. The T TLV, TWA should be used as guides in the control of health hazards and should not be used as a fine line between safe and dangerous. But Dr. Newman says you can. You can use it to determine safety and danger. Uh, 
if I had to put my money in a basket, I think I'd put it with, uh, with OSHA here, uh, you know, and some of the people who, who are doing the research in this particular area. And again, you can see the wide variation. In the USA, the worker exposure is 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air. Uh, in the Soviet Union and most of the uh, European countries, it's 10. It's one-fifth. Then there's another set of standards, environmental protection. So if you go out into the streets of Chicago with this machine and you get a reading higher than one, they're looking for the factory that's spewing mercury. Because you see at one, they're concerned. Because out there are healthy people and sick people. Out there are pregnant people and non-pregnant. Out there are male and female. Out there are young and old. And out there are susceptible and non-susceptible. In the workplace, you can control people and you can test them. In the real world, you've got to have a much lower safety standard. So using TLVs in dentistry to say it's safe in the patient's mouth is absolutely ludicrous. What we should be using minimally is the Environmental Protection Agency standard, which is the standard for general population, not for working population. Another misconception is that large amounts of elemental mercury vapor are needed to produce toxicity. And this is absolutely false. Goodman and Gilman's textbook, uh, you know, uh, shows dramatically that there's a low-dose mercury phenomenon. Micromercurialism is a scientific fact now. When one reviews the literature, low-dose mercury exposure produces a syndrome called micromercurialism. And there's a whole group of symptoms that go with it. And these symptoms almost immediately disappear upon the removal of the source of the vapor exposure. And Dr. Chang showed dramatically that even low levels of mercury vapor exposure uh, will cause blood-brain impairment. Well, let's look at some of these low-dose effects. <coughs> We've now talked about mercury coming off the fillings. We've talked about it correlates with brain tissue levels. We've talked about people finding brain levels actually in human autopsy subjects. We've talked about briefly the fact that some animal experiments have shown that mercury from fillings in animals gets to the brain. But what are the effects of low-level mercury exposure? Well, I'm just going to look at a couple of systems, but the, the blood system, for instance, uh, and I've given you all the authors of the research on one side, shown that hemoglobin synthesis and function, platelet function, and lymphocyte transformation are all affected by very low doses of mercury. Uh, there are lymphocyte chromosomal aberration. The, uh, the number of T cells and their uh, viability is altered. Uh, the immune system uh, and immu autoimmune diseases and antibody formation has also been shown to be caused by mercury. So mercury in the blood is not a good thing. Low levels will cause these kinds of effects, the kind of low levels that we anticipate some people are getting from their fillings. If one looks at the nervous system, we find that uh, ganglia cells uh, are affected. Uh, myelination and, and neurite growth is affected. And in fact, at low, low levels of 17 micrograms per cubic meter of air, some people have fine finger tremor. A blood-brain barrier transport is affected. And there is a syndrome that's MS-like. And this is where some of the controversy comes in. Mercury exposure will produce an MS-like problem. That's scientific fact. Now, it's very different to say that there's an MS-like syndrome attributed to mercury and going out and saying we can cure MS by taking fillings out. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the literature shows that some of the symptoms of low-level mercury exposure uh, mimic MS. Interesting. Should be researched, I think. Uh, amalgam and MS, there's a, an epidemiological study, several of them, uh, suggesting that some way, somehow, people's oral condition seems to correlate with multiple sclerosis. Uh, Preliminary studies by Al Roth Westerlund showed that MS patients had a higher level of mercury in their cerebral spinal fluid than non-MS patients. Interesting. Should be more research done in that, I would think. Maybe there's something there, maybe there isn't. And lead and zinc are also involved in, you know, in, in demyelinating diseases. So what about the person who's exposed to lead as well as mercury? Okay, so you have, you have a situation here where there's multifactorial. Another misconception is that dental amalgam presents no health problems to patients except for those few individuals hypersensitive to mercury, estimated to be less than 1% of the population. This was the famous conclusion of the uh, NIDR ADA workshop on the biocompatibility of metals in dentistry, which occurred in 1984, I think here in Chicago. I'm not sure. I think it was here in Chicago. And that was the conclusion of their panel. 
Their conclusion was estimated to be less than 1% of the population. So we don't have to worry except for a very small number of people who are allergic to mercury. Well, if you go to the literature and you look for the scientific facts to verify the 1%, here's what you find. You find studies done on hypersensitivity with dental students show an incidence of 2 to 10 percent, or 27 to 39 percent allergic to mercury. If you look at studies with the general population, you find uh, studies showing 8 to 26 percent. And the big study, the American Contact Termititis Group, says that it's 5.4 percent. And people who have oral lichen planus, and these studies were all done, I, I believe, uh, in, uh, in Sweden uh, and the Scandinavian countries, show that uh, 16 to 62 percent of the people with oral lichen planus uh, are allergic to mercury. And lo and behold, when you take the amalgams out, the oral lichen planus clears. And there's some suggestion that perhaps there's a relationship here. So I don't see less than 1 percent. Most of these are dental publications. Most of these are by dental researchers, published in peer-reviewed dental journals. I find it interesting that the panel couldn't draw its own proper conclusions from what's available scientifically by the people they fund. Now, I think, to give them credit, that it may have just been an error. But you see, once stuck with an error, no, I mean this. I don't, uh, I'm not going to take sides yet. But once stuck with an error, when faced with this data, and people have sent the data into them, you would think they would correct. But there doesn't seem to be a correction forthcoming. And that concerns me. All right. Well, let's look at the North American Contact Dermatitis Group study. Now, this is a big study. This was 13 research dermatologists across the United States and Canada in 10 geographical areas. They examined 16 substances in 1,200 people. This was no small study, 1,200 people. And one of the patch tests that they used was 1% ammoniated mercury. Not mercuric chloride, because supposedly mercuric chloride has the irritation properties and it's not accurate, okay? Ammoniated mercury is very much like the urea in your sweat, and so it's uh, a form that's non-irritating, and so it's more reliable. And these are the guys, these are the biggies, this North American dermatitis group. And they showed that in blacks and in whites, that in females and in males, that the, uh, the blacks had a very low sensitivity to mercury as an allergy, whereas the whites, the females were at 8.3 percent and the males were at 5.2 percent with a total of about 5.4 uh, percent. So if you take this study as being uh, the cornerstone of allergy in this area, about 5 percent of your practice, if it, excuse me, if it's all uh, Caucasian, 5 percent of the people walking in would be allergic to the material that you're putting into their teeth. So if you have 1,000 patients, it speaks for itself. 50 are going to be having problems, just allergy. And of course, if you multiply that by 225 million people, you've got a problem. Now, you've got to ask yourself another question which comes up. Why is there such a difference between blacks and whites? Could it be socioeconomic? Could it be that uh, maybe blacks need and get less dentistry than whites do? Is there a greater exposure uh, to, to mercury in the whites than the blacks? Or is it just basically genetics that, uh, that the blacks have a better genetic resistance to, uh, uh, to mercury than the whites? We don't know, but it's kind of interesting. And there's a 40% greater chance of reactivity if you're a white female than if you're a white male. And most dental practices are made up of females as patients. And their conclusion was that the, even the lowest prevalence rate of 2% in this series is high enough to justify an antigen inclusion in a screening series. So they recommended that dermatologists routinely screen for mercury. And the American Dental Association recommends that if you think someone might be allergic to mercury, that you what? Send them to a dermatologist to be screened. Which means that really what you should be doing is sending everybody who you got, because you don't know who the 5% is. And if we did that, the dermatologists would never be able to handle it. They might retire young, but they'd never be able to handle it. So conclusions. Mercury is released from dental amalgams. Mercury levels appear to exceed safety standards. Uh, the compartmental distribution of mercury uh, is significant to brain tissue. Uh, amalgam mercury hypersensitivity and toxicity has to be a factor. And uh, further research is mandatory. And uh, in conclusion, we go back to what's been known for a long time. Depending upon the dose and the frequency of exposure, the onset of symptoms to inorganic mercury poisoning may be delayed as long as 30 years. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that we are indeed 
faced with a toxic time bomb, and you probably heard that term before, that perhaps, perhaps, dental amalgam is a slow insidious, at best, is a slow insidious uh, cause of some problems. At worst, there may be a large number of people out there who react very quickly because of their allergic ability to the amalgam mercury. And I'm here to say that we don't know yet what diseases are caused by mercury exposure from the fillings, if any particular diseases. But we do know that the gum tissues do not respond well, that micromercurialism is a fact, that brain tissue is, is, is having a lot of mercury collecting in it, and that the developing fetus is very susceptible to mercury. And I am pleased that the expert committee in Sweden has concluded and recommended to the Swedish government that amalgams not be used in pregnant women and children. And of course, that's about 80% of the population, isn't it? If none of the children get it, they won't have it as adults. And if the women don't get it, you've gotten rid of 50% of the population right there. It would seem to me, in conclusion, that there's reasonable doubt with regards to amalgam safety. And that it is prudent of us not to exaggerate this and make wild claims about disease processes and curing this and curing that. But it is prudent and responsible and professionally morally proper for us to look at our history and say, an error has been made. Let's correct it. Thank you very much. Different mercury compounds differ regarding metabolism and toxicity. The central nervous system is critically affected by methyl mercury and metallic mercury vapor. The fetus is stated to be the most sensitive individual. The kidneys are also a critical organ affected by mercury vapor. From an odontological point of view, especially metallic murky vapor is of particular interest. Yes. Dental amalgam is a multi-phase alloy consisting mainly of mercury, about 50%, silver, about 35%, tin, about 15%, and silver is sometimes replaced by copper in varying amounts. It is still yet the most common material used for single tooth restorations. In his classic work from 1957, the Swede Frykolm showed that dental amalgam gives off mercury vapor during the insertion and removal of fillings. As you can see, it's it's a peak here uh, after insertion and after removal. However, there are a number of professionals that consider dental amalgam to be a very stable material which does not give off mercury in any form of the setting. This is wrong. Several recent studies have shown that even old amalgam fillings continuously emit mercury vapor. A Canadian study by Vimy and Lorscheider shows that vaporization increases extensively during chewing. After chewing gum, it takes more than an hour before the emission returns to baseline. The research in this field has recently intensified and there are important results from several epidemiological studies concerning effects on health due to amalgam fillings. However, more well-defined studies are needed be before conclusions can be drawn. At present, there are thousands of people in Sweden who consider themselves to have been poisoned by their amalgam fillings, a fact that is highly embarrassing. In the following, I will describe parts of our recent research. 
At first, I would like to refer to a published study in which samples from the central nervous system of 34 autopsy cases were collected, namely from the occipital lobe cortex, cerebellar cortex, ganglion semilunare, and also from the kidney cortex. The samples were analyzed for total mercury content using neutron activation analysis. All cases were forensic ones with sudden and unexpected death, without any signs of recent tooth extraction or other types of tooth loss. In all 34 cases, samples of the occipital lobe cortex were analyzed. In 19 of the cases, samples from the cerebellar cortex were analyzed. And in 14 of the cases, also from the ganglion semilunare. At a later stage of our study, I decided to collect uh, kidney samples when possible, altogether 12 kidney samples. A dental record of each individual was compiled. As there are very few adults in Sweden with no amalgam fillings, toothless individuals who had complete sets of dentures were considered as an amalgam-free group. Information about occupations could be established based on case history, date and case history and data retrieval from Swedish population registers. I don't know if you know, but we have very good data registers about people in Sweden, which, of course, is both bad and good. We have a big brother looking at us. Okay. Information about occupations could be established based on case history, as I said, and, uh, but it, it is still yet difficult to get all information. So in one case, a retired electrician, we couldn't exclude a possible earlier occupational exposure to mercury. For the material as a whole, we did not have the opportunity of studying possible co-variation between mercury concentrations in diet, namely fish consumption, and smoking habits. We could also identify individuals who were chronic alcohol abusers, verified by medical records, autopsy reports, and biochemical tests of blood, liver, and pancreas. As you can see, the levels of mercury in occipital lobe cortex are about as high as in cerebellar cortex. Ganglion similinare show considerably lower levels. Concentrations in the brain cortex are equal to those recently reported in an American study by Eggleston and myself. Earlier studies have often reported higher average levels in brain cortex of about 100 nanogram mercury per gram wet weight. However, it is impossible to make a direct comparison between the earlier and the more recent studies because the analytical methods differ, as most earlier studies had, no, had inadequate quality control. And it's very important to have a quality control when it's very difficult to analyze mercury, all forms of mercury. On an individual basis, there was a strong correlation between mercury concentrations in occipital lobe cortex and cerebellar cortex. A, cor a corresponding correlation existed between ganglion semilunare and occipital lobe cortex. It is highly difficult to evaluate the exact amalgam load value after death. Therefore, I made a visual odontological evaluation and counted the number of fillings, or even better, the number of tooth surfaces containing amalgam. The correlation between the number of amalgam fillings and total mercury levels in occipital lobe cortex was significant. The number of tooth surfaces containing amalgam with a maximum of five surfaces per, per tooth was also significantly correlated with mercury concentrations in occipital lobe cortex with a p-value less than 0 0.001. And I, I would like to say that there is no correlation between age 
and occipital lobe cortex and murky concentrations within occipital lobe cortex in the entire materia. As I mentioned before, we couldn't exclude occupational exposure for murky in one case. This case showed higher than expected murky concentrations in brain cortex. Later analysis of the pituitary gland revealed an extremely high murky content of 780 nanogram murky per gram wet weight, compared with a median level of about 28 nanograms in a control group. This finding speaks strongly for an earlier occupational exposure. If we exclude this case, the correlation is strengthened. And it is that case. There may be other factors that affect mercury in the brain. For example, Nielsen Kutsk in Denmark, 1965, showed that ethyl alcohol has an inhib inhibiting effect on the catalase oxidation, which is of importance for mercury vapor uptake and metabolism in the body. Thus, a substantial amount of mercury vapor is exhaled after being circulated in the body. I mentioned previously that nine of the cases had been classified as alcoholics, and our results show that several of these cases had lower mercury concentrations than expected. Here, 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 here. It's just one above our 95% confidence interval. It is. It is thus not surprising that on average the alcoholics had lower mercury levels in the brain. I think it's, it's, a, it's however difficult to recommend <laughs> another poison or drug against mercury poisoning. But I know that some dentists in Sweden do that, at least before removal of feelings and uh, I, I don't want to recommend it but personally I think it's good <laughs> okay we also analyzed kidney cortex from seven amalgam barriers with 11 to 33 amalgam surfaces. And you can see with an average of 433, median 326 nanogram, range 48 to 810. Compared with five amalgam free cases with average of 49, median 33, range 21 to 105. And I think this is a, an important finding because recent experimental animal data show that uh, immunological reactions can occur within brain, uh, kidney tissue at very low mercury levels of inorganic mercury. And there are data indicating the same mechanism for humans. But more research need to be done. Uh, I can tell you that recent unpublished data by myself has also showed a st statistically significant relationship between murky concentrations in pituitary glands and uh, 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 between mercury concentrations within pituitary glands and amalgam load. And uh, our concentrations is at least three times higher in average in pituitary glands compared to brain cortex. It is of, of course a shortcoming only to specify the amalgam load at time of death. Several cases may have had more feelings earlier in life. 
Unfortunately, it was impossible to get such information, even in Sweden. Another shortcoming arises with cases having double prosthesis, as in the amalgam fee control group. This was the only way of having an amalgam fee group, as there are very few adults in Sweden without amalgam fillings. And now I would like to present findings from an extensive similar study by David Eggleston and myself from 1987. In this study, occipital lobe cortices were collected from 83 cases. All cases had their own teeth, including the amalgam-free controls. The amalgam load was estimated by counting occlusal amalgam surfaces. These surfaces were considered to be most important because of the effect of mastication uh, on, uh, on the release of mercury from dental amalgams. The same analytical method and equipment was used and in, as in the Swedish study, with a good quality control. And uh, the results showed significantly higher total mercury levels in occipital lobe cortex from subjects compared to controls. Intermediates showed higher average mercury concentrations than controls and that was also a significant difference. But, uh, and the classification was done by Dr. Eggleston before we carried out our analysis. And as you can see, controls are classified like from zero to one amalgam surface intermediates from 1.5 to 4, and subjects from 5 to 14.5. And that was David Eggleston's classification. And here you have uh, the mean concentration. And as you can see, it's a big difference between these groups. White matter from the occipital lobe was sampled from 60 of the cases. Total mercury analysis showed about the same significant relationship between occlusal amalgam surfaces and mercury concentrations in a white matter as for occlusal amalgam surfaces and cortex. Even though these studies are not con conducted in exactly the same manner, the results corroborate each other. Freeberg, Eggleston, and I have recently reanalyzed the American data in exactly the same way as the Swedish study by means of counting the total number of amalgam surfaces. An analysis shows a regression equation similar to the one observed in the Swedish study. We are soon going to publish these data. So, Strong agreement between the American and Swedish data is therefore obvious. Based on these studies, it, it is reasonable to conclude that exposure from amalgam fillings is associated with elevated levels of mercury in the brain and the kidneys, and thus increasing the body burden. The average contribution of mercury from amalgam in brain cortex is calculated to be about 10 nanogram mercury per gram wet weight. However, we do not know anything about the individual spread in a population. At the present time, we do not know what these levels mean from a toxicological or immunological point of view. But what we do know is that all forms of mercury are poison to the body. Now I would like to summarize a paper published by Clarkson and co-workers a study in which I also participated. This paper is a critical review of recent scientific work about the release of mercury vapor from amalgam fillings and a prediction of uptake of mercury vapor via the lungs. 
We did not consider other possible routes of uptake, such as the gastrointestinal tract, the pulp tissue, the mucosa in the oral cavity, and the nasal mucosa. One reason being the difficulties of estimating, estimating uptake via these routes. Uptake via the lungs, however, is considered to be volume-wise the greatest uptake route. I'm not saying the most important. The estimated daily uptake varies considerably between studies. We found the study by Abraham and co-workers to have less uncertainties, at least when using our calculations. As you can see, the estimated average uptake is 8 microgram per day using Abraham's data. And try to remember uh, the steady state contribution to uh, urine and brain too. Although there is no time to go into great detail about our calculation, we assume that on average the subject's exposure to mercury vapor is four hours per day at fully stimulated mercury vapor generation with 100% oral breathing. During this period, it was assumed that 50% of the generated mercury was inhaled and then 80% of this is absorbed via the lungs. Thus, four hours of stimulated release would contribute an amount to the daily absorption of stimulated release equals release rate nanogram per minute times four hours times 60 minutes, should be 60 then, times 0 0.8, times 0 0.5. Unstimulated release is assumed to apply during the remaining 20 hours. We assumed 0 0.25 to be the fraction of time spent for inhaling through the mouth. The daily amounts absorbed may be used to estimate the mercury accumulated in tissues after long-term exposure at steady state conditions. These <coughs> calculations are based upon available experimental data, and especially short-term human data. According to our assumptions, the estimates were calculated from a general equation often used by the double H Oh, I'm sure several of you are familiar with that equation. An obvious weakness with our estimation is that the calculations include a rather short half time of about one month in the brain based on human short term studies. There are smaller compartments with much longer half times in the brain. Unfortunately, we know little about the metabolism of inorganic mercury in brain tissue, so we were not able to estimate these longer half times at that time. Thus, it is highly possible that we have underestimated the total mercury burden in the brain. For further details, I would like to refer you to our article, Clarkson and Coworkers from 1988. However, the estimated contribution of mercury to, from amalgam in the brain and kidneys using data from Abraham and co-workers study is in agreement with autopsy data from Eggleston and Elander studies. If the estimated urine mercury excretion is compared with available empirical data, they are also in agreement. This is a figure from a Swedish study by Langwort and co-workers on the x-axis, we have number of two surfaces containing amalgam, and on the y-axis, uh, the urine mercury concentration. There is a significant correlation between the number of amalgam surfaces and urine concentrations, which is in agreement with the correlation we found between the number of amalgam surfaces and mercury in brain tissue. So it strengthened our data. The average contribution seems to be about 2 to 4 microgram mercury per liter urine. 
However, some cases have several times higher concentrations of uh, up to about 15 microgram mercury per liter urine. This has been confirmed by myself. It is also pointed out by Clarkson and co-workers that so-called worst cases may have several times higher mercury concentration in urine than the average concentration. As I said before, the estimated release rates from amalgam appear to be consistent with levels of mercury found in autopsy tissues in the general population and with increases in brain tissue levels due to amalgam fillings. However, I would like to add that the empirical data from the brain which Clarkson and co-workers used for comparison were mercury concentrations in occipital lobe cortices for my own study. It is possible, or highly possible, that the agreement is less in other parts of the brain due to other biological half-times and possible uptake routes, for example, via the nasal mucosa. It is therefore possible that Dr. Vimus' estimations of 68 nanogram mercury per gram in brain tissue is in, uh, in in total brain it is uh, quite accurate and uh, they fit well if you compare with my recent unpublished data with the impetuatory glands. Now to an important point that I don't think has been described before. If we compare the contribution of mercury from amalgam fillings to urine with mercury levels in urine from occupationally exposed persons, the average contribution from amalgam fillings is estimated to be slightly less than 5 microgram mercury per liter urine. But some individuals have values of about 15 to 20 microgram mercury per liter. If these levels are compared with urine mercury levels found after occupational exposure, which in several earlier studies have shown average values of about 50 to 100 microgram mercury per liter, sometimes without clearly related health effects, the contribution of mercury from amalgams seem to be of a minor degree. However, more recent occupational studies have shown effects on the central nervous system and kidneys, such as slight tremor and glomerular proteinuria at urine mercury levels between only 20 to 35 microgram mercury per liter. Uh, even if it is difficult to evaluate these results in detail, no safety margins seem to exist for people with extensive amalgam fillings. And I think that's very important. In my opinion, the effects of amalgam fillings may even be underestimated when making direct comparisons between occupationally exposed workers and those exposed only to amalgam fillings. Some explanations of this are Number one, if certain working conditions impose serious health, health problems for an individual, he will leave his work either through sickness or by changing his job. Thus, there is a selection out of the workforce of individuals who cannot tolerate their working environment. This is the so-called healthy worker effect. Number two, Another problem is that the reference groups in occupational studies are normal populations. Hence, they will be amalgam bearers to an average extent. Therefore, we should be careful when making comparisons between occupational exposed groups and reference groups because even the reference group has been exposed to some degree and may have amalgam-related health effects. Number three. The duration of exposure has been reported to be of importance for the development of mercury effects. Exposure from amalgam normally starts in childhood and is often lifelong, 
whereas occupational exposure is considerably shorter, approximately 10 years, as reported in various studies. Number four. The general population exposed to amalgam is so much larger than the occupational exposed. For example, occupational studies have at the most included a couple of hundred workers. Well, I think uh, Smith's et al. study from 1970 included 567, but it isn't so much either. Number five, the type of exposure is different. People with amalgam fillings are exposed continuously every minute of the day, year after year, whereas occupationally exposed people are exposed a maximum of eight hours a day, five days a week. They are also unexposed during vacation time. Another important difference is that most occupational studies have been conducted in chloralkali plants, where both vapors of mercury and chlorine are evaporized to the air. An experimental animal study published 20 years ago by Viola and Cassano, Italy, showed that rats exposed to high concentrations of mercury vapor showed severe nevro neurological symptoms, while another group exposed to the same mercury vapor concentration and simultaneously high concentrations of chlorine or, or chlorine vapor showed no neurological symptoms. Animals exposed only to mercury vapor showed 10 times higher mercury concentrations in brain tissue than those exposed to both mercury and chlorine vapors. The reason for this was suggested to be transformation of mercury vapor to mercury chloride. My thought is that the exposure of chloralkali workers to chlorine may protect their central nervous systems from mercury vapor released from their own amalgam fillings. We need more research within this field. Very important. Consequently, one must be humble due to the question, how safe are amalgam fillings? Today, no toxicolo toxicology experts can consider amalgam fillings to be safe. And now over to another important source of information, and that is the occupational exposure of dental staff. International studies over the last 20 years report average values of mercury vapor in clinic rooms of about 20 microgram mercury per cubic meter. Some clinics noted values as high as 100 micrograms. Sweden and NIOSH in the United States have threshold limits of 50 micrograms. Further, momentarily high exposure of up to 1,000 microgram may occur in the breathing zone during removal of fillings without access to adequate suction and water cooling. This exposure is reduced by at least a factor of 10 if conventional suction and cooling are used. Uh, dentists and dental assistants are, are of course exposed to, during polishing and, and insertion of fillings to very high levels. And it's also important to know that during removal, we are exposed, both dentists and dental assistants, to high levels of metallic mercury vapor, but also to particulate mercury. So it's, it's mixed. And we do not know much about uh, the metabolism of particulate mercury in that form. The urine mercury concentrations have often showed average readings of 15 to 40 microgram mercury per liter urine. Thus, no safety margin for health effect exists for dental staff. In several individual cases, readings were as high as over 100 microgram. If these readings are compared 
with a WHO's recommended urine limit of 50, 50 microgram mercury per liter urine, which should not be exceeded by any person. They show evidence of a considerable exposure. All these facts, and moreover, there are reports of severe mercury poisoning of dentists documented in the scientific literature show that there is a potential risk of mercury poisoning for dental staff. Unfortunately, no markers exist by which we can measure the amount of inorganic mercury in the central nervous system of living persons. Analysis of blood primarily indicate the exposure undergone in the last few days, whereas urine mainly indicates exposure during the last few weeks. I have tried to find an available indicator medium easy to apply to living persons and found a, a very strong correlation between total mercury levels in muscle and total mercury in occipital lobe cortex. Muscle biopsy may be used as an indicator medium for inorganic mercury in the brain, but more studies are necessary before any conclusions can be drawn. The amounts of inorganic mercury and organic methyl mercury in this type of samples uh, need to be carried out also. In review, the differences between the concentrations in the pituitary gland and occipital lobe cortex on an individual basis in dental staff are considerable. Possible reasons or combinations of reasons have already been discussed by Dr. Sturtebecker, and this is an important question for further research. It is not known what the highest concentration found in pituitary glands means from a toxicological point of view. Corresponding concentrations in brain tissue in an experimental study on rabbits by Foucault and co-workers resulted in neurological disturbances as tremor and behavioral effects. However, the pituitary mainly cons contains glandular tissue, but also consists of nervous tissue in the posterior lobe. It would be interesting to conduct a distribution study of mercury in the pituitary, which we unfortunately have not yet been able to do. But I've, I've done some small studies, and the mercury seems to be evenly distributed within the pituitary. Regarding the toxicity of mercury, the relationship of mercury to the methalloid selenium in tissues may be of great importance. In experiments on animals, selenium has been shown to form an indissoluble complex with inorganic mercury, and thus protects against inorganic mercury poisoning. It has not been ascertained whether this is valid for humans too, but there are data indicating the same mechanism for humans. Uh, and uh, I have some research in progress about this topic, and I do hope to report my results quite soon. Hopefully at the International Conference on Biocompatibility of Materials in Colorado Springs this fall in coming November. Finally, I want to state that a logical philosophy within environmental medicine of today is to minimize the total body burden to mercury and other heavy metals. Our largest uptake of inorganic mercury is stated to be from amalgam fillings in our mouths, as published by Dr. Vimy and Dr. Lorscheider and by Clarkson with co-workers this year. I would like to conclude with two slides summarizing the empirical data I have presented. Statistically significant correlations exist between the amalgam load and the mercury concentrations in human brain and kidney. Thus, amalgam gives a considerable contribution of mercury related to the total body burden. 
dentists and dental nurses or dental assistants accumulate very high concentrations of mercury in their pituitary glands. Thank you very much. It is now well established scientifically that patients are being exposed to mercury from their silver amalgam dental fillings constantly each and every day and that this exposure increases when the fillings are subjected to chewing, brushing and heat. It is also well established that mercury is so poisonous that no exposure can be considered totally harmless. Dental patients should be informed and should have a choice. Dental amalgam is inexpensive, durable, and easy to place. For some, these might be important characteristics. Others may consider potential harmful effects resulting from exposure to mercury from these fillings may be more important. Tell your dentist how you feel. Ask questions. Ask to see actual studies supporting the position of your dentist. Is the position based on scientific knowledge or on review papers or merely what others say? It is your body and your health that is at stake. You are entitled to sound answers. If you become convinced that mercury silver dental fillings are a potential risk and should not be used, make your feelings known. Tell your dentist. Tell the officials of organized dentistry. Tell the political and governmental authorities. Help yourself. Help your family and loved ones. Help your fellow man.